So very warm welcome uh, to this uh, afternoon's uh, special conversation uh, on uh, systems thinking, state capacity and grassroots uh, development. Uh, this is something that uh, we've been looking forward to uh, for almost a month now. We've been kind of planning uh, behind the scenes uh, to make this happen. Uh, I'll come to uh, the story behind it uh, so that it sets, uh, sets up this conversation um, and provides the context. Um, this is uh, driven largely by um, our friend uh, M. Raj Shekhar's uh, recent book, um, uh, Despite the State. Uh, it's based, it was a culmination of, uh, yes, there's, there's the book, Raj Shekhar putting it up. Um, and uh, it's, it's a culmination of, um, of about, what, two and a half years of um, pretty intense uh, reporting from six states across India, uh, a project for Scroll magazine, which eventually culminated in, in a book, uh, which got published earlier this uh, month. And the story is that when the project got over, the reporting project for Scroll got over, I remember connecting uh, Raj Shekhar uh, to Mr. Arun Myra, uh, because he was searching for a, a framework to really try and kind of uh, uh, develop the, the ideas in the book. And uh, they had a very interesting conversation in Mr. Myra's uh, home uh, around the whole idea of systems thinking and how to really unpeel a lot of the uh, very good work that had happened from the ground uh, across these six states, studying very different kind of uh, phenomena as well uh, across, these, uh, across the country. Uh, it's a rare um, uh, reporting project because more and more uh, journalism is kind of moving away from its, its core of going out there in the field and reporting back. Um, but this book also, I think, builds on that uh, as well by offering a very interesting tapestry of, of issues and understanding uh, of different systems as they try and interact. So we uh, thought it would be a useful um, conversation to plan uh, this, this afternoon with Mr. Myra's help, and he's very kindly offered to lead this conversation. Um, and um, so I'd, uh, we thought we'd, uh, apart from Rajshekhar, we'd invite two other people whose work in some ways is, is extremely distinctive. Mekila, who um, has, I'd met her many years ago uh, in her early stages of, uh, as a researcher. Now she's uh, a professor at Ashoka, does, is doing some very interesting work at, uh, at uh, CPR as well. Uh, again, her lens is also, a lot of it is multidisciplinary as well as uh, field-based research, which is something that we perhaps need more of in this country for the quality of research to go up. So we're delighted to have uh, you on board, Mekila. Um, and, um, uh, look forward to hearing from your experience as well. And finally, Harish Hande. I mean, he, of course, needs no uh, introduction, but uh, uh, Harish is someone we, when I was at uh, Forbes, our team essentially interacted with. He wrote a brilliant essay for us for our, I think, third anniversary edition, where he talked about the concepts of sustainability and, and how India needs to essentially go back to some of the Gandhian principles. Uh, of caring for small businesses and farmers, and that's those ideas are more than important now. I mean, it's become critical, right? So, so that's uh, where it is. Uh, we've got a very interesting um, and diverse audience. So, I'd like to welcome all of you to this conversation. Maybe as a start, uh, what you could do is uh, in the chat box try and kind of key in where you're joining us from, which city. Uh, it'll give us some sense, it'll give the panel some sense of uh, all the people. I've introduced all of you on, um, on email as well, but it'll be nice to hear. And as a matter of fact, I think it'll be useful to ensure that you use the chat box while this conversation is on to share some of your uh, comments and um, uh, questions that you might have for the panel as the conversation rolls on. Um, my colleague, uh, N.S. Ramnath uh, will be anchoring the, the chat. Um, he will, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, share and build on some of the comments uh, that, that are coming in. And we will 
of course, pick up a few questions as well. Um, obviously, a topic of this kind can't be addressed in a 90 minute conversation. So I'm hoping that this small community, if you like, can keep the conversation going uh, with the panel and uh, all of you uh, together. Uh, we'll find some mechanisms towards the end of it to try and see if that, that is possible. So without much ado, um, I'd like to now invite Mr. Myra, um, who's obviously been a big source of uh, inspiration for a lot of us at, at Founding Fuel um, and the community as well, um, to really set the context. Mr. Myra. Thank you so much, uh, Indrajit. Uh, you have provided me for the last 20 years, uh, you personally, um, uh, the opportunity to meet with some wonderful people. And we're talking about a, a great journalist here, Raj Shekhar. I'm sure he'll also acknowledge that you are one of the greatest. Hmm? And you had this quality about, you know, inquiring into uh, the world through uh, the lenses of others and directly also. I'm here in this room, uh, Indrajit, uh, where Raj Shekhar and I talked, as you mentioned, um, I forget how many months or years ago even, seems a long time, um, a very good couple of hours we talked. And I'm so pleased to see what came out uh, earlier this month. This uh, absolutely um, thought-provoking book, uh, despite the state why India lets its people down and how they cope. And to come at the end of this, uh, not even yet the end, but during this time of the COVID where how India lets its people down and how they are coping is just around us. It's just around us. It's just around us. So it's a wonderful occasion and with a wonderful person and uh, as well as a very great thought provoking book to uh, anchor our discussions. I'm delighted that uh, you were able to uh, get uh, two other great friends from whom I have learned a lot. Um, Harish, uh, Hande, uh, my friend there, and Harish, I'll, I'll say some more a little later about what you have taught me. And uh, Mekla, who continues to, with a sparkle, uh, teach me a lot of things. And now, uh, as you might have noticed, as some of you who were here before, uh, her little daughter, who is uh, uh, more sparkling than she is, uh, continues to stir imaginations <laughs> about ourselves and the world around us. So to imagine having a conversation between Rajshekar, Harish, and, and Mekla on uh, this subject about what's happening in our country now and why are we collectively, I'm going to call up all of us as um, well, extensions of the state or the state, letting down almost everybody in the country, but certainly a very large number of people uh, in this country. This week, the last week of January is a very special week in India. We have in this week, on the 26th of January every year, the celebration of our Republic, the birth of our constitution, a constitution in which was promised to all citizens justice, social justice, economic justice, and political justice, promised to all the citizens the liberty of thought and faith, and a promise to all citizens of equality of status, of status and opportunity, as well as fraternity. Just this week, if you were to just reflect on what's happening around us, do we see justice, liberty, equality for all citizens? Do we see fraternity? 30th of January also falls within this last week of January. It's the day on which we mourn violence that a single shot of violence that killed the visionary who had laid before us this idea of justice for all, liberty for all, equality of all, and fraternity amongst all. And it has, I think, uh, since then, clouded our visions of who we are and how we will live together to live up to 
the values of our constitution. Gandhiji, whose death, assassination, uh, we mourn today, returned from South Africa with a vision to free India from the British. It's seen uh, the British in South Africa or white people in South Africa oppressing others. And so he wanted to come back and free his own country back in India. And Gokhale told him that before he, with his very activist vision, marched around to make India free of the British, he needed to first see his own country, to travel and to listen to the people in the country. Rajshekar, Gandhiji was a predecessor to the nature of journey that you took. First understand, as Gokhale said, understand your country, understand the people in the country, understand life from their perspectives before you will know, can know how to act. And Gandhiji produced this vision of Purna Swaraj, which uh, is uh, put into words in our constitution. And he was clear that um, people could not have political freedom unless they had economic freedom, and that economic freedom could not be had for all equally unless there was social freedom. For him, these weren't abstract ideas. And he felt that conveying to people that this is what they will get if they were to someday later, which he hadn't planned at that time, sign up for a vision which is now explained in our constitution, they wouldn't get it unless they could experience it, experience all these freedoms, the political freedom, as well as economic and social freedoms in their lives. To come to now this year, 2021, on 26th of January, the day on which we celebrate our constitution and the Republic, we had, in some ways, unfortunately, uh, a curtailed parade of the show of the central state's might, which we do every year on the 26th of January. And every year on the 26th of January, we have staged tableaus of the diversity of the states and the people of our country, their costumes and their music. And, and this year that was curtailed too. But what appeared instead was the, the symptoms of the condition of the Indian state behind its pomp and show when crowds of people, thousands who had been patiently uh, sitting outside Delhi in the cold, old people, young people, men, women, saying the state has not functioning, our democracy is not functioning. And yet to be ascertained how many appeared at the Red Fort where we hoist and had hoisted on 15th of August in 1947, our flag and displayed their unhappiness, maybe violently, some of them, but their unhappiness with the condition of the Indian state. So this is a very timely uh, discussion this, despite the state, why and India lets its people down and how they are, they are coping. We have uh, said that we will not tolerate violence, but right now, the, the argument, the discussion is about uh, um, who, if anybody, uh, used violence, a physical violence in these recent events of the last uh, uh, few days. But and we are putting aside the discussion about the violence of the power of the deep state and a discussion about the condition of the economy and society from the perspective of the 90% or more of the people whose well-being cannot be judged by how the stock markets are doing and they're doing very well. We have, I think as a, as a republic, as a democracy, suppress the voices of people. And we are paying attention to, to some numbers, some indicators, which matter to very few people. And so it was in this spirit that there was this protest about the reforms, which are supposed to be 
for the benefit of the 90% people, um, or many of those amongst the 90% of the people, uh, reforms which were going to grow uh, the GDP for sure, perhaps, and might reflect in further growth of the stock market, but would it really affect uh, the, the economic well-being and the social well-being? And certainly it wasn't doing anything for the political freedom of people to uh, uh, express themselves in the democracy. Now, Gandhiji um, um, was, uh, in any way, the provocateur, the architect of this uh, vision of all freedoms for India, was a systems thinker. And he knew that, that the economic system is formed by a political system and that the political system is shaped by a social system. And it's their interplay on the ground that creates the realities in the lives of people. And this is what Rajshaker in his book has done very well, I would say. I, Rajshaker, uh, I haven't shown you because physically you're not here anymore, but I have a habit of you know, making two or three notes at the start of a book with the page reference of I can quickly find what I'm looking for. So I started as usual and it went down one thing, page, then I ran out and I started looking for other pages onto which I could write more notes. And I so have been filling up all the blank things in the beginning. I'm, I'm glad that I got a print version and publishers you know, waste paper with putting all the white spaces. But thank you very much. And I know- I'll have to come see your copy for sure. <laughs> and I noticed that uh, your stories, the way they are written, they bring out the interplay of systems. They bring out the interplay of systems. So I myself started to make my systems maps. Like this is the story of Tamil Nadu, which is how Tamil Nadu has been running out of water while its GDP has been growing with urban construction. And in that story, you can see and you pointed out the interplay between the castes in the rural areas, how some are able to take or need to take advantage of other opportunities. And so the community, the rural communities become diminished in their diversity and divisions begin to arise, which the political system takes advantage of and perhaps needs to for the sake of winning its own votes. And that in turn then creates another vicious cycle in terms of where the money flows, both for politics uh, as well as into the projects and so on. It's very well done. And I could do this for all the six states and think it's something that we should do uh, together because it tells those stories and pictures. Now, yourself is a, is a narrator of stories and all systems are stories actually, stories of lives of people interacting and changes in the physical conditions over time. Um, very well done. So thanks for the good introduction now. Now we've got three persons here, yourself first, Rajshaker, who as I said uh, just now, is a great observer and a great storyteller, which is what a great journalist is, observes very well and uh, tells the story, the, the whole narrative. Mekla, my young teacher, um, um, is a scientific also, I and mean, she's works on the ground and tells me some very amusing stories of, especially in relation to the, these farmers and agriculture matters. Um, but looking for a scientific explanation, looking for the pattern in many stories, and what is the scientific explanation of why that pattern exists. And finally, Harish uh, Gandhiji, you have, and I'm gonna show this to everybody. I keep it very proudly. This is what your father had put together, woven to be left at the ashram uh, in Andabad. And um, they weren't receiving any more that year, so it was the last slide. And I, for so many years, I, I must be 15 years, I've kept it right in front of me. And you have been on the ground like uh, Gandhiji, where uh, you experience, you're an activist like he is, you want to actually make the changes, not just the studying of it or the accounting of it, like perhaps uh, uh, you may think, uh, um, or we may think that uh, a journalist and, uh, and an academic are not so much into trying to make the change, but I know that these two persons are, but you are absolutely there. Been for years actually making change on the ground and experiencing the powerlessness of many people and uh, the powers that 
uh, are resisting change and improvement in the lives of for those people in the system. So we've got three lovely perspectives into what's going on in India right now. And I'm going to be asking each of you uh, to uh, share whatever you would like to share in this context uh, today. Oh. 10 minutes, uh, each of you. Uh, let's see what from your lenses, from your perspectives, you want to share with, with all of us. And I'm going to begin with you, Rajshaker, since you are the person who is uh, set up in a way by what you put together for us this discussion. Okay. Um, to start with, uh, good afternoon to everyone and a big thank you to uh, Mr. Myra, uh, who I have been impressed with from the time BW did that special issue on innovation. Uh, that is when I gushed to IG about Mr. Myra the first time. Uh, a big thank you to IG uh, and to Founding Fuel. And uh, I'm really glad that Mekla and uh, Mr. Hande are here. And when I look at the rest of the people who are attending this, it does feel a bit like an extended edit meeting of business world, which is uh, good news for me because I'm generally a fairly nervous uh, speaker in these events. My medium is one-to-one. -one. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, I'll give a very brief uh, overview to why I decided to work on this reporting project. The biggest professional hazard of journalism is being blindsided by events. The, the person that I think of when I say something like this is off late William Scheider, who wrote Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. Uh, he was in uh, Nazi Berlin between the mid 30s and the early 40s. And the story he missed was the Holocaust. Uh, that is one sort of uh, big lesson that I really carry about journalism with me, that it's very, very hard to belong to the time that we live in. Uh, and for that reason, when the 2014 elections happened, I found myself taken aback by that election verdict, uh, despite being a rural India reporter, despite being a field reporter who travels a lot which essentially meant that this country had changed while my understanding stayed static. And so what I needed was a refamiliarization. Uh, how do you refamiliarize yourself with a country like India? Uh, you pick up a set of states, uh, you go live in each of them, uh, you travel incessantly, all of that. But more than those, it makes a lot of sense to focus not on the events playing out while I'm in each of these states, which between them add up to the diversity of the country, but to focus on structures and processes shaping, uh, revealing themselves as large changes in these states, which is what I was trying to do um, during uh, that scroll reporting project. Uh, in today's session, I wanted to talk about one businessman that I met in uh, uh, Ludhiana. His name was Harbhan Singh Bhavar. Uh, when I met him in late 2015, his machine tooling firm uh, had lost all its overseas customers. Its top line had crashed by over half. And uh, he wasn't the only one suffering from this uh, Malady, so to speak. Uh, when I went to Punjab, one of the first things I got to know was that the entire state was seeing deindustrialization. Large business groups like the Nahars, Hero Cycles, uh, Birdie Cycles, and so on, they were starting to set up expansion units outside the state. Smaller units, unable to relocate, were shedding staff and starting to shut down. Uh, when you sort of hear about something like this, the standard answer that the brain supplies is that, oh, it must be Chinese imports. Our guys are not able to compete against very, very cheap Chinese products. Uh, 
And the reason that I want to start today with Harban Singh Bhavar is because um, it was in my meeting with him that I realized that the reasons for Punjab's deindustrialization ran deeper than import substitution. Uh, I still met, remember when I met him, it was a Saturday morning. Uh, the industrial cluster where uh, his unit is was slowly coming to life. It was around 9.30 in the morning. And I was, uh, like all generally unemployed reporters, walking around in that area, hoping to find some unit which was open so that I could go in and talk to people. I don't really have a great methodology in that sense. Uh, I see the uh, premises of craft food, which is not a very big building, really. I go inside. Uh, Mr. Bhambar was there, and we sat and had chat for about two hours, where he started by talking about how the unit came into being in 1965, around the time when Ludhiana itself was flowering into an industrial town helping Punjab uh, uh, with both the implements for the Green Revolution and the machinery for processing the proceeds of the Green Revolution. Uh, so Mr. Bhavar spoke about how um, he and the town grew together. They rose together during the Green Revolution. They suffered during militancy, bank nationalization, uh, the emergency gained again under liberalization, uh, essentially moving in sync. And then by 2002-03, he had begun exporting to Italy, for example. And then things went downhill again. And when I asked him, why is your business shrinking today? He had done something very dramatic. He didn't say a word. He just got up. He walked out uh, into this adjoining anteroom, came back with a file, threw it on the table, opened the, to the first page, jabbed his finger on the file and said, Ye kya hai? Unknown, here, uh, will you just bring out that first image? Hello? Yeah. Okay, the second one, that is the electricity bill. Yeah. He, he jabs at, you see the column in the middle, it says Octroy and Kausas. He jabs at this particular point and says, Ye kya hai? Okay, Punjab was charging Kausas, Octroy, Infrasas, etc. on the power bill. Uh, these additional insertions five, six of these had pushed the cost of power in Punjab to eight rupees a unit at a time when neighboring states were, um, like HP were charging four rupees a unit. Uh, around here, you know, um, it would be very, very easy to write a snarky, smart, elegy piece saying that, ha ha, look at Punjab, they have causes of the Bijali Ka Bill kind of a thing. But if you take a closer look at this, you will find a kind of a rationality. I won't even call it a perverse rationality. I'll just call it a particular rationality. Why does Kausas come into a power bill? Uh, it starts with militancy. Under militancy, tax collections in the state collapse. A bunch of government departments stop functioning. Uh, tax revenue collection is one of them. Government revenues, uh, that, that particular machinery collapses. Post militancy, the tax collection mechanism is not rehabilitated because that makes for bad politics. But 2015, the only bill people in Punjab are paying, therefore, is the Bijali Kabil. And therefore, every time the government needs additional revenues, it adds duties, cesses, surcharges, uh, whatever you call it, onto the Bijali Kabil because. Bijali is a compulsion and everybody has to pay. That is what happened with the cows. Uh, this is the time when the Gaurakshas were roaming freely. Farmers could not get rid of aging cattle. 
uh, whether it is uh, they usually don't sell them directly to uh, butchers. A aging cow will be sold to a smaller farmer, and so on and so forth. Uh, now farmers began to find, with the gaurakshas roaming around, that they could not transport cattle anymore. What they ended up doing was bringing those cattle into big cities and leaving them there in the hope that the cattle would get enough to eat. Uh, this creates a stray cattle problem for the municipality of, say, Ludhiana, which asks people for donations to set up new cow shelters, but funds aren't coming through. Uh, the industrialization also means that uh, people have less money to spend. And so what they do is they say that, look, bijli compulsion hai, sabhi ko dena hoga, usme cow says ka ek entry kar denge. Which is how this whole thing starts. Uh, when I was in, uh, at that time, when I was working on this report, I also learned that from March 16, Punjab was going to collect water charges through the Bijli Kabin. Same set of reasons. Water collection mechanism has collapsed. There are not enough water meters. Uh, but those, uh, uh, but the municipality is running low on funds. So they come up with this brainwave that thinks, uh, Punjab State Electricity Corporation has a 99% payment rate. We will just add a new surcharge of water onto this and we'll uh, re you know, uh, generate revenues from there, uh, which is one kind of a suboptimality. I, I won't go into detail on why this is a suboptimality because it's all evident to you, right? Water users are a very different constituency from industrial units. And this is cost subsidization. It's a market distortion. The industrialization is one kind of an outcome. And yet, when you look at this a little, so let's say this is the first layer of the proverbial uh, onion which is being peeled. The reasons for deindustrialization run deeper than high power rates in Punjab. Uh, one reason for that, a uh, really big reason for that is predatory extraction by the ruling party in power, that of the Badals. Uh, at the time when I was there in the state, the Badals were collecting anywhere between 3 to 4% of net profit from private companies in the state as their uh, tribute. Uh, I heard this from a bunch of businesses. Uh, there is uh, also a, a, a researcher called Nicholas Martin who writes about this uh, in a paper published in a book called uh, The Wild East. Uh, which I have, I'm going to read out a little bit here. Uh, many informants allege that in the past, corruption in the state happened only at the highest levels. Congress leaders in the state, they claimed, only took money from big business. Whereas the Akali government, then in its second term, took money from everyone. The party leadership allegedly had shares in every business in the state, from media outlets to dhabas, and bus services to commercial property and industry. Businessmen who refused to pay tribute to the party leadership faced bureaucratic hurdles that caused the businesses to shut down. Uh, this, this, when you sort of pick up this notion that the political party can extract rent from private businesses, uh, and when you look at that, you find a wider phenomenon playing out. That wider phenomena is that over the nine years the Badals had been in power, they had established a very, very strikingly effective capture of the state economy. Uh, Punjab is one state where investigative journalism is thriving. And so the Tribune newspaper has detailed how the Badals captured bus transport, cable distribution, etc. When I was in the state, I saw how the Badals had uh, annexed cash generating businesses like liquor distribution and stone crushing. Um, and look at the consequences of this. Uh, half of the liquor in the state was being sold illicitly. So uh, 
according to a former finance secretary who had then become the cabinet secretary of the state, the quantum of revenues not flowing to the government were about 5,000 crores. This money was going directly to the Akali Dal government, which among other things also created a financial, uh, uh, essentially sort of meant that the state wasn't, was getting less revenues than it needed. And one chance outcome of that was things like uh, infrastructure and electricity duty and causes and off draw and the rest of it, uh, interconnection services. Uh, this leaves me with um, two large points that I want to make at the end of my little soliloquy. One, while I was moving around in these states, the Make in India campaign was launched, essentially saying that, look, we have to reinvigorate the competitiveness of manufacturing in this country. And we know some of the reasons why manufacturing is uncompetitive vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, in a lot of sectors, the input providers, uh, be it, let's say, the steel makers, they managed to get fairly strong uh, import duty slapped on cheaper steel imports from outside, which keeps them fine, but has the very unfortunate effect of forcing all the manufacturing and ex engineering companies, which are exporting to global markets, struggling to compete with rival firms elsewhere in the world, which are using cheaper steel. This sort of uh, analysis we're familiar with. What we don't get is the fact that rent extraction is also a significant factor retarding uh, manufacturing competitiveness in our economy, let's say. That's one point that I wanted to make. The second thing that I wanted to say is that it will be a really awful mistake to assume that this lack of competitiveness is a purely economic problem. Uh, one, I was in Punjab for a total of four months. And many things horrified me in that period. Okay. Um, it's either a very horrifying state of affairs or I just get very easily horrified. But one of the things I saw in Punjab was that the entire public health machinery in that state had one cardiologist. It had zero neurosurgeons. That's the entire public health system across the state. Uh, people told me that in case they cannot afford treatment at a private hospital, then doctors tell them that you go to the hospital Essentially, make the last days comfortable. And this raises this very obvious question. Why aren't there enough cardiologists? Uh, the first level answer is that the salaries are too low. Punjab pays something, was paying something like 40,000 rupees a month around 2015. Not exactly market rates. Why is the state paying only 40,000 rupees? Because the health budget is not large enough. It was some 3,000 crores. Why is the health budget large, not large enough? Because of foregone revenues. They were losing 10,000 crores a year from stone crushing revenues that flew directly to the Akali Dal, uh, 5,000 crores from liquor. Uh, and, and we could do this accounting for. 10 or whatever number of industries the Badals had captured. Uh, things had reached a point where villages had, this crisis extended into education as well, naturally. And things had reached a point where parents in villages were looking for volunteers to come and teach their kids in government schools. The question that this leaves me for, for today's conversation is that, uh, okay, uh, okay. Uh, Every state I went to, Mizoram, uh, Manipur, Orissa, Punjab, Tamil Nadu, Bihar, and Gujarat, I saw variants of these stories playing out. Um, the question that it leaves me with is that in all these maps of relative decay, uh, 
the political party and the compulsion for fund, the need for funds for election expenditure is a very, very large factor. Uh, things have evolved in a manner where the political parties gain privately, individually from this process of extraction. And yet, in a democracy, the primary problem solving agent is the political party. So how does one bring in reform in a system where the key agent of governance is gaining from its kleptocratic capture of the, of the country? That is roughly what I had to say. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Chaitan. So, uh, uh, just two um, uh, things that have struck me. Uh, one is that, uh, um, uh, for example, if you want to make a plan for uh, the growth of industry in Punjab, you can't ask the industry secretary uh, to make the plan because the causes of deindustrialization de don't lie within industry. They are in other systems. So the need for having, if you might call it like a whole of government approach or a whole systems approach to these uh, systemic problems uh, that are being faced in Punjab, public health, education, and industry uh, can only come from thinking of the whole system and where the cause effects and root causes uh, of the problems uh, lie. Uh, the second, as you pointed out about the political parties, now this is a universal problem around the world that uh, people are uh, very frustrated with political parties the Republicans in the US and the Democrats uh, in the US and, and so on everywhere. And there's something about the design of a, a democratic system which has put uh, too much emphasis possibly on the election systems uh, rather than other processes of democracies uh, that has put you know, so much a need for political parties to grow and to, 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 to gather money to, to, uh, to canvas and advertise and so on. Um, and maybe spend money for votes and to grow. Uh, but that's a bigger uh, problem, which you pointed out when India needs to solve this problem. My point was that we are a, a democracy. We've been relying too much on uh, a, a model of democracy, which is an electoral democracy. Hmm? We've got to think of other institutional arrangements which will make democracy healthy. So those two questions only are for me. Uh, I'm going to ask Mekla for your thoughts, please. Thank you very much. Um, it's uh, an enormous pleasure and privilege to be here. It's wonderful to be reconnected to Indrajit by Rajshikhar. I think that was our first introduction and again, a reconnection. Um, a great uh, privilege to be on the panel with uh, Mr. Hande. Um, you know, to um, Mr. Mayra, who was so generous in his introduction, um, who has, I think, been a source of incredible wisdom and encouragement uh, over many, many years. And even though he will never believe it from any of our interactions has taught me to, to listen uh, better and to understand the role of, um, you know, somebody who has to play to, to facilitate even when you might want to jump in and give your own opinions. And I think that is something that we need to think about in the context of this conversation and I'll come to that later. Um, and then finally to Raj Shekhar. So huge congratulations on the book. Um, I, I first met Raj Shekhar when I was starting off on the PhD beginning to work on Mondays. Um, he had already been a reporter for many years and was doing incredibly grounded uh, research and reporting even then, um, but uh, you know, is was not only in, always exceptionally generous with connections and insights, but also with books. He's the kind of person uh, that we may be academics and I may have a bookshelf behind me, but he's the kind of person who I've never met once without him giving me a reference or actually just giving me a book. Uh, and. You know, I think he's done that to all uh, who know him well. And, uh, you know, it's an, an extraordinary generosity. And that's one of the things you will find in the, the book as well, uh, in his own book, which is the reference to many other kinds of writings and thinkings and reflection that are interspersed with this very dense and uh, vivid and complex narrative that he weaves for each state, right? And it's like literally landing in the middle of a story in each case, but, the guidepost is not just all the connections that Mr. Mayra has already pointed out to and the ways in which complex politics, society, culture, economy interact, but also uh, the guidance he gives us through um, reading um, and his own reflections. Um, I'm 
my apologies for the, the chaos happening outside. <laughs> um, my daughter is running around. So, um, you know, so it, it, I think that that's another really wonderful thing about the book. Uh, I do want to say, you know, so particularly for me as somebody who currently is also working on an initiative titled the State Capacity Initiative, uh, it's an incredibly challenging book because you really wonder what it means uh, to build state capacity, how you should begin to think about state capacity, the intimate relationship between state capacity and state capture. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it leaves you, um, I don't know whether it leaves you with a lot to get into or just feeling that this is a very uh, challenging, if not futile um, exercise. So um, it is an enormously challenging text. I think it's one that is necessary for us to read. Um, I'm just going to spend a few minutes uh, reflecting um, on, you know, some of the things that came to mind as I read this. I think you talk about this period, you know, 2015 to 2020, and, and now we're, you know, just beginning the new year. Um, and in 2015, when the lynching of Akhlaq um, happened in Dadri, I was teaching in Dadri at the Shivnadar University. And I was teaching a course on sumptuary laws, on laws that the state frames to shape consumption. And um, that week we were talking about bans and the state. And that was the week that Akhlaq was killed, uh, very close to where the university was located. Um, it was in a class on state citizenship and bureaucracy and on the powers of the state. So this was this one moment framed my beginning as a teacher um, over the last several years, incredibly challenging to think about how are we to teach these concepts in Delhi NCR during these times. And so, you know, you mentioned this um, event and the incident in, in your book, um, although you didn't study UP. Um, and, you know, it, it has been a trace throughout for me in trying to make sense of some of these relationships. And today I teach at Ashoka University, which is just a few kilometers from the Singhu border. And I'm teaching a course this semester called Gift, Commodity and the Exchange of Value. And we began by thinking about both the place of the gift and the commodity in Singhu, um, you know, at the border. Uh, today, because this is a protest against laws which are about regulating commodity exchange of agricultural commodities. Uh, and so the commodity and the life of exchange, the role of the state and the market is writ large there and the debate is around that. Uh, but the protest itself has shown the possibilities uh, of a reimagining, right, of how people come together, of how collectives come together, the idea of langars, of seva, the you know bringing together of a different way of thinking about provisioning, um, and you know the Indian Express ran that little story called the Republic, the self-sustaining Republic of Singhu. So you know we see all of this come together, um, and so as I was reading your book, which I'm sure uh, many classes will assign in the future, um, it makes you really think about what does it mean to to consider these questions um, at this particular time, and so. Um, just to say the extraordinary relevance, I think, of this text um, as we look at it. But um, I also wanted to say, and since you are hearing Akhila patter around, uh, you know, the other day she was studying nouns in school and um, name, place, animal, thing, after which she asked me, Amma, is government a person or a thing? And I said, well, you could actually add place and possibly animal in there too, um, as you start thinking about what right, is the state and what is government. Um, it's also important to ask, is it a noun or a verb? Because so many things in the idea of the state and in the idea of government uh, is often a noun with the force of a verb, right? Gift is also another word, which is a noun with the force of a verb. Uh, so is the word riot. Um, you know, a noun with the force of a verb. So these are small elementary lessons, but, you know, it struck me as I was reading your text and the book that there's so many of these, you know, things that we go back to asking very simple questions. What are we talking about? What are the connections? Um, but personally, I found it very challenging because my engagement with the state over the last 15 years uh, began with a different starting point. Right. Just as you went and have given us six cases of what you call state failure, 
Um, I think I began my work looking at Mahila Samakhya's uh, work to mobilize women in rural Gujarat in creating Nari Adalats, right? And the evolution of women's courts uh, that you know, piece was called in the shadow of the state in the shade of a tree, the politics of the possible in rural Gujarat. Uh, so you know, it was a different kind of beginning where I went looking for things that seemed to be working. Right. Um, I then worked on the everyday life of the Bombay police and found a whole group of policemen who write poetry uh, in, in the city of Bombay or Mumbai, the city I grew up in. Um, and then I worked on public health and I worked with extraordinary doctors in the Mumbai system who built, you know, Dr. Fernandez and others in Sneha who built these extraordinary referral systems and ran Sion Hospital and in Chhattisgarh with the State Health Resource Center that created the Mitanin program, another exceptional program in terms of looking at what you can do at scale within the state. Um, you know, I think this is probably why I'm trying to run a state capacity initiative and <laughs> Not, uh, you know, anything else, but this is where the inspiration for me has always come from, right? It's actually been looking at how does the state work when it does work. Um, and so I wanted to say that I found it challenging because, you know, yesterday as I was reading the chapter on Odisha, I was sitting in on a meeting where the government of Odisha was talking about the Kalia program, one of the more innovatively and carefully designed uh, cash transfer programs, which actually look at inclusion of including sharecroppers and tenant farmers, right? So, and I was reading your chapter on Orissa and on extraction. Um, and I think this raises to me very important question that all of us need to collectively ask on. Whenever you come to examples where the state seems to be working or public systems work, um, we look at them as islands of success. Right? We look at charismatic leadership and we talk about islands of effectiveness or success. Um, whenever we come across systemic state failure, we see it as generalized, right? Um, and this struck me as something that, you know, we need to think about. Is it that these are islands of success and failure? They're happening in the same state. So how do we make sense of it? How do we say that they're, you know, do we look at them as you know, just two possibilities in the same state, um, or as many political economists would urge us to look at it, as these are the kinds of things, populism, you know, a well-functioning PDS in Chhattisgarh at the same time that you had Salva Durum, um, you know, Madhya Pradesh's improvement of Mandis at the same time that you have, you know, extremely worrying um, indicators on other side. Um, you know, Tamil Nadu talk about populism. Do we look at these as many have said they are just the flip side of extraction, right? The things the state has to do to keep the population passive, to keep them from revolting too much, right? So is this a cohesive story where all that seems to be good is really not, um, you know, when you put it in the larger context of political economy, all that innocent? Right? Or do you see them as I have chosen to, as the beginnings of a different way of organizing things and no less arbitrary, right, um, than the other side? And this is not to take a naive view of the state at all, or of politics or of political organizations, but to ask about these arrangements that we seem to put in place. Um, let me just add a couple of points here. The first is that I think in all of these cases, right, even when you didn't see complete success, the presence of the state of public systems, even in their partial broken form was important. It was important for two reasons. One, it was important because sometimes actually material support, relief, aid did in fact reach Right? There were frontline workers and functionaries who somehow against all the odds did make systems work. And there was actually the provision of certain kinds of services that were important. But as importantly, the fact that the state at least attempted to do it or did not withdraw that attempt meant that citizens used it right, in different kinds of claim making, sometimes to the state but sometimes outside the state as well, 
right? So, you know, uh, this is the Nari Adalats, for example, would put everything on stamp paper. They would often cite laws like 498A when they knew that the court system was extremely hostile to women of, you know, they were Dalit and Adivasi women who ran these courts. But they always talked about the formal court. They talked and cited the formal law. They put their things on stamp paper. They sat and put their boards in the police station, right? And in each of those actions, there was a claiming of this space. And that to me was always powerful that they said it. They also said, hum policeman ke kabhi kabhi wo vardi na thode, hum log pente to nahi hai, just borrow karte. No? So they knew the difference between borrowing a symbol and wearing it. They also knew the challenges that the policeman has to deal with uh, when he actually has to wear power, right? Uh, in his uniform. The policeman, on the other hand, used to often purchase the second jodi of his uniform from street vendors outside the police station, put on that spare uniform because he had run out of copies, you know, uh, uh, pairs of uh, belts or his clothes, um, and then say, now I'll wear this vardi and shoo away the hawker, right? Uh, his own children used to have illegal electricity connections um, to read and to do their homework by. So all of this was happening, right, at the same time. But even, you know, and I find this true today, even with mandis, uh, to me, it's very striking when farmers defend mandis. We know that for a lot of this time, these are institutions that have not worked as they should have worked for them. But I think the very fact that a mandi may come up might exist that a level playing field or a publicly regulated market may come up where they can actually access, you know, good price discovery or fair payment matters to them, right? Um, and so I wondered in the text as I read it, some of those moments, like is, are we, you know, not seeing some of this, right? Because it also feeds into a narrative uh, very powerfully of the withdrawal of the state, that the state has failed. So now actually, you know, we have to find other ways. Whereas I think these stories of the partial, the, both the moral or the normative power of the state and its physical material presence is extremely important. The other thing that I wanted to say is that, you know, we see this in the informal economy. One of the reasons for the persistence of the informal economy at the scale that it is in India is also its interrelationship with the formal economy, right? And the formal system. And this is something that comes through in, in, in various parts of your narrative as well. But you see this very clearly, that the formal and the informal are entangled. And you see this in partial regulation as well, right? Partially regulated systems also produce certain kinds of relationships that then become very important for survival in the system, right? Um, and some of this also reproduces a kind of um, you know, inequality, right, that persists as well. So I've been thinking about it in recent times in terms of the Indian system is extremely good at absorbing a lot of people. Uh, it keeps many, many interests alive, but very few manage to accumulate, right? There is exploitation, there's extraction, there's also dependence. Today, again, in the case of farmers, when farmers say that Artyas provide us credit when we need it, this is not just a symbiotic relation. It's also a relation because of the failure of formal credit, but it's also extremely difficult to design formal credit systems that are as flexible as farmers require them to be, right? So somewhere in this, I think this is the key challenge and you have the section on GST. And you know, I would really like to hear what everyone also else feels, but I think this is the core challenge of also transition and formalization because these systems are so interconnected, right? And I think, you know, I was saying, what would happen if we stopped using the word vested interest and just started with interests, right? And then move to seeing where they actually become vested, where they become survival strategies, where they're actually adaptations. Um, because, you know, it, it struck me, this is the quote that I often refer to, it's by Bernard Schaefer, who wrote on the room to maneuver, Barbara Harris White also often quotes this, where she says, he says, there is no lack of will, uh, no lack of political will, but a scatter and conflict of wills, inconvenient for some, not for others. But reform is not just a question of removing impediments once they have been listed by a methodologist. Reform means indicating just where the interests are grounded where the lines of opposition are drawn, 
the pain and guilt felt and hidden. This is there in your text. You know, you help us do this. But I think that, you know, maybe this is something that we can, and I wanted to end with one last point uh, about the title. So I spent some time thinking about how we use despite and how we use in spite. And I said, what would this say if we said, in spite of the state, we have this story. In yours, it's despite the you know, failure, the capture, the corrupt, the violent state, people survive, right? But it's also in spite of the state, we seem to keep failing, right? So something about vested interests, interests, and shared interests, Something about what do we have to do, right? If, you know, and, and, and the other problem in the state capacity literature is that usually instead of in spite or despite, we say, if only. If only India was less democratic, things would be better. If only India was less decentralized and diverse, things would be better. If only India was richer, things would be better, right? In that context, I sometimes say it's better we start with in spite, despite, move forward, think about how do we create, you know, new systems for public investment and for, you know, better institutions. And then maybe we can say it is because, right, of some of these things. So I, these are just some, some ideas to start. Um, and, and, you know, but thank you for writing the book and, uh, you know, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Mekla. Mekla, you raised uh, three epistemic questions in my mind, uh, and you do that always. Um, and here they are. The first one, as you said, uh, as reading uh, Raj Shekhar's book, uh, he raises so many things and uh, doesn't quite sort them out. He just says, here are all these things, and you can see something murkily connecting all these things. So it leaves you a bit confused and lost, the words that you used. And I say, that's the beginning of learning. When someone says, I'm now lost and admits it, then there's a chance the person might find the right path. And this is the tyranny of merit, of uh, expertise, which you know, many people are writing about today that a lot of the political problems, as well as the uh, anger against the establishment is arising out of this epistemic approach that you have to be certain and give a very precise uh, explanation and a very sharp solution. And if you can't do that, then you are not worth it. You're not an expert. But your expertise of no value if it's not answering the questions of the day. So those people who admit that I'm a bit lost, there's a hope that they will find the answers or help us to find the answers. So thank you, Rajshaker. And I think, Mekla, you're saying this too, that this is a gift to us to say, just stop and think. You don't really have the answer. And the world's looking for the so-called new normal also. The second one, is about uh, Akila, your daughter's the thing about the use of words. And uh, the government is not a person, the government is a, is a uh, oh, well, it's not neither a thing. As you say that the you know, things are at verb, nouns which have a action in them. And I think of the word institutions. And a lot of things about institutional reforms and we keep thinking about the thing, the design of the justice system that we want to, to, to reform. Whereas uh, institutions are processes. It's how things work, how things move from point A to point B. That's institutions. And we live. Life is the process. It is the change. So how do we get from here to there? And I think in reforms, we have always sort of emphasized what the new state should be, like you're pointing out, and say, we've got to get there in spite of all these things. You've got to get there. It's the transition, we live in transitions. We don't pay attention to this process of the rearrangement of powers, the loss and gains of powers in the process of transition to get from here to there. And with that, I'm just wondering this lovely word, the disastrophe. So uh, <laughs> maybe you write a book now with the title, Disastrophe. It would probably be a good title for your project actually. But then comes to this point about what you very, I think for me, the, the very special point, we have to move on. So looking for things that work, in spite of all this, how do these things work? In spite of you know, a dysfunctional uh, 
uh, a state and uh, a lack of resources. In some places, change is working. So that's where you as an anthropologist come in. You study, as I've known you, um, with respect and to understand, right? And this approach is required. I try. <laughs> and I think we need this. We need to look for things that are working in spite of everything, how do they work? Why do they work? And there would be the seeds of ideas for getting from here to there, because we can't jump into the there. We'll have to take advantage of the good things that we have in the here and learn from them and to, to get there. So these are epistemic ideas that you have laid before us. Uh, thanks a lot. And Harish, uh, uh, not the least at all, though you're the last amongst our three uh, observers today, uh, our, our guides. Thank you, Arunji and uh, uh, Indrajit ji. It's like, now you've put me in the last of after Rajshikar ji and Mikhla. He has uh, spoken. So where do I start? Uh, I was saying, see, uh, as I've been telling Arun Saab for so many years that for us, I mean, for me personally, for many, for looking from the ground up is like a lot of things other th other than even other than the state also has failed and i think and i'll start with with when i mean i went to iit kharagpur purely because 300 million indians did not write the exam if they had written that exam i would not have gone into iit plain and simple and today who gets the money in our country it's the powerpoint word and excel the vernacular speaking crowd have no chance, absolutely no chance of getting failure monies that I would be able to raise to innovate or be an entrepreneur or get financing of the lowest interest rates. So practically if all of us on this uh, Zoom did PhD on sugarcane, we are all experts of sugarcane, a farmer doing 45 years of sugarcane will never be called an expert he will be, he or she will be standing, sitting below and we will be on the panel telling him what to do. And I think the way we are, I mean, the failure of the middle class and above middle class, even thinking that my maid servant's kid has to be my kid's maid servant is a classic failure about saying that I confuse between intellectual poverty and financial poverty. And that for me is the biggest failure of our education system until we don't iron that out. And see the question, a true democracy is also about democratization of services. And those democratization of services of whether you look at health, education, livelihoods, opportunities that, that everybody of us has the ability to create. And for me, uh, Arunji, in the last nine months when, when, the, when the corona started and we have 800 people, was, 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 theek hai, abhi band ho gaya. Abhi 800 jan ka salary hai. And there are two, two parts to it. Now that we've been working, we've been working in this sector for the last 20 years. We had 2020 to 23 years. Two, two tensions came in. One is, yes, 800 people ka salary. The other is, what will happen to the people uh, or, or small or companies or organizations or social organized, I mean, uh, companies, especially in the rural areas of Meghalaya, Manipur, et cetera, in our sector of energy sector, which whom we have nurtured over the years. These are non-English speakers who find it difficult to go to the bank, get equity, debt. And these are jewels, gems, who have been created with passion and saying, because oh, humko be renewable energy rural areas, mein, we have to do it. Now we had that sector. On one hand, you had Selco. On the other hand, boss, a sector ko bhi kaisa bachai. The issue for us, ki, hai, April was closed. Then after that, we opened up in May. And, uh, and no, I mean, a lot of people said no, no Sundays as holidays because we are not an organization where it's like a restaurant that is closed for lunch and dinner. It's crisis time. Uh, COVID is kind of a trailer to, 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 to climate crisis that's coming up. Uh, we can keep harping, we can keep sit down, we have work from home. I said, work from home, boss. Farmer to work from home, nahi karega. Uska fir, uh, who, who work from home coming to fear how how will this is the time for the youngsters to showcase what crisis is and then we opened up in uh, may may and, and it said boss that's and and uh, the lot of us started traveling as soon as the flights i mean now 24 7 we travel is because if we do not put in systems in place right now we can keep saying nothing is happening but 
who will put the systems who will show alternate systems to be put in place that somebody else can then replicate and scale up because that's out there it's like just as a disaster hota na floods hota hai lot of people jump in to help but the crisis happens after two months when when if you break the poor into three categories poor very poor and abject poverty the, once the person comes from poor into abject poverty it takes two more decades to go into poverty and that's what happens after floods and that's what exactly what has happened after covid now we forgot okay boss what do we do and for me yes we've been talking about a lot of the other failures uh, in in our previous 10 15 years but what i realized in the jit sahib in the last one one year is most of my friends who from the iams and the iits were the most useless characters for advice because if i look at the collapse of our industry in the rural areas rural businesses none of them had the capability to help them because the advice structure that they were all familiar with is what a ecosystem was already prepared and they were all advising where they did not know what the ecosystem was like boss receivable simple thing is oh, why don't you collect the receivables i said boss jisse paisa collect karna hai wo bhi poverty mein chala gaya okay or whether centralized supply chains have collapsed how do you actually create recreate a business and then lot of them gave up actually 99% of my friends who have got a so called iit and mba and I all gave up and said boss i might be head of a company 1000 crores but i cannot help you boss they had no advice that showed me a classic failure of this whole education system that we all tout as elite who can actually decide when actually could not help a single small enterprise way in manipur or jharkhand or bihar how do you suddenly come to a decentralized mechanisms where trucks have failed the lot they have to how do you come up with a cold storage system in rural kalahandi where you create a business model using a farmers producing organization where the vegetables can then be sold in the local markets the guys had no clue because we are so fascinated by scale that we forgot the basics of building society building bricks and which what the experience and then is then so i said boss forget it boss we went to the rural areas i picked up vernacular speaking journalists a uh, rural journalists and said boss tere ko to pata hai kuch rural bankers i put put got back retired uh, bankers from syndicate bank kendra bank the traditional bankers who who blended social capital and commercial capital many many years ago they were the experts now saying that we've gone through the whole crisis of the of the 71 72 the whole concept of 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 what why you needed financing for water pumps for in the agriculture during the agricultural revolution whatever and the setting up of the rrbs the rural, regional rural banks and the biggest assets that we have forgotten is the itis the vocational schools which brought back because a lot of the kids who go to these vocational schools are the owners of the problems because a lot of people did not realize that until you don't own a because classically the way we are taught in this the elitism of of middle class above middle class i will come up with a solution and then we'll try to fit a problem to it right without understanding owning what the problem is and this though we were looking uh, rachikar sir we were pushing the ecosystem approach from last 15 years but covid actually showed us that the ecosystem approach is the only approach to actually create a fundamentals of creating any delivery models that is socially and environmentally sustainable and that's the beauty of a country like ours which breaks the diversity between from manipur to thail from manipur to kanyakumari to gujarat is that you have floods you have terrains you have you have droughts you have cropping patterns that change that an ecosystem approach for a country like india is absolutely replicable for any parts of the world because if you look at creating an ecosystem for energy access and delivery of sustainable health education and livelihoods in upper assam you can actually replicate in philippines because which has an equal structure same thing the financial disparities and the immaturity of the financial systems in manipur is equivalent to what you look in tanzania so india becomes a hotbed of systems thinking hotbed of solutions and hotbed of linkages between health education health energy energy education all the 17 to 18 hdgs that then becomes a superpower of solutions for other countries to actually replicate but for that how do you create mechanisms 
where rather than thinking that I am a mechanical engineer, it's like typical, na, ki if I am a to tomato vendor, tomorrow if the tomato prices goes up, does she go back and say, boss, tomato prices has go back, my expertise is tomato, I'm not going to sell tomatoes, her three kids will go for starvation. She comes, so the problem anywhere is like, as we get more educated, we become less useful for society in many ways, because this, I'm not a mechanical engineer. I'm not an electrical engineer. I need to be a solution provider. And that's what we need. You go there, boss, there are sewing machine, solar power, mein chal ha, boss, I'm a sewing machine, solar power. What is the market linkages? What is the financial product that needs to be plugged with the sewing machine so that she can actually play? Okay, does she have the market linkages? Solar power, ke karan, instead of doing two shirts a day, she does eight shirts a day. I can create financing. But if somebody does not question, does she have the market to sell the extra six shirts, her technology will be a debt. I can write photographs and my reports and I can raise money on that, but she has gone into poverty and I have gone above poverty, right? So the systems thinking needs to happen in every game. And how do we break those? I'm from Punjab or from Haryana, I'm a Hindu or a Muslim or I'm a mechanic. It's same as I'm telling I'm a, I'm a mechanical engineer, I have a PhD in energy. It's no different to any other bifurcations that we do. I'm sorry, it is any, it's no different to any other bif bifurcations we do. How do we levelize that field? And the system thinking basically creates that levelized thinking, a levelized level playing field where a poor kid has an equal chance like you and me kid. And until that system, and it's not only the state, is every citizen is actually responsible for creating that system. See, one of the biggest barriers, I told Arunji, one of the biggest barriers and when youngsters join my organization is not my, my, my cutoff is, my, my looking at salaries, a lot of people don't apply. And uh, when, yeah, when people say market salaries of Bangalore is high, I said, did you actually calculate all the auto rickshaw sa driver salary also? Who defined market? Is the market defined only when people have masters and PhD or work in IT? Is that market salary? What is market salary? Who defines the market salary? The biggest challenge for me is the parents. When they come, sir, hurry, aapke organization mein join karne se social work to sir, 60 years ke baad. I said, we are not social work. We are, we are defining what social sustainability is. Sir, ladki nahi milega shadi ke liye. I said, boss, that is your problem. Ladki nahi milega shadi ke liye. sir, unka cousin one lakh IT infosys mein kaam. The problem lies there. Ki Shivaji Gandhi, Gandhi ji has to be born in neighbor's house, not in my house. So my question is the fundamental failure of our own thinking process. It has to be changed. We can blame anybody. Yes, I said, I said, was water leak kar no, no, government karna what is your solution of actually if you were the is officer of bangalore what you nahi sir, wo hum nahi. exactly we are good complainers we will not get our hands to solve it and that to solve it you can you cannot get a better country in terms of systems thinking and not i'm and, and arunji you know i'm not a nationalist for me a poor of sri lanka is no different to a poor of tanzania to a to, because flag like i mean question was the only place where i support india maybe in cricket but i feel about that's a different story but the question is the power the the country boundaries there are two wars from outside if there was a war from mars we are not going to say i'm a indian i'm a hindu i'm a muslim i'm american somebody else has to fight it the two wars are climate change and poverty and that has no boundaries and for that system thinking is just like as of seeing how do you create those pieces of the puzzle at different parts like like for example it could be today what happens you know uh, when, when I design solar for a sewing machine, everybody says solar is expensive. Nobody says that the sewing machine is inefficient. <laughs> the lathe machine is inefficient. This is the industry, the baby warmers. You know why baby warmers are not in the rural parts of India? It's not because you cannot do it, not because you cannot provide it with LV. Baby warmers are inefficiently designed by the best of the companies because the operation cost is not on their head. They only do the capex. Where do you hold the industry to, uh, uh, to, 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 to saying that you're also equally responsible for doing it? Where do you hold the individual? I had a police guy who came in. Uh, we do this 
just to disprove the myths among my youngsters that somebody is bad. I said, everybody is good. There are certain bad people in every institution, whether it's a police. The police guy said there was a red light. The one kid had crossed the red light. And then the guy caught him. Like he was red light dekha nahi kya? Sir, red light dekha, but aapko nahi dekha mein. Right? The question is, it's about that system and why we wear helmets. We helmets not because we're going to get killed, because the police will catch us. So the systemic thinking that we need to actually have about how to solve, and 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 uh, yes, you know, from um, I mean, I mean, I, I the la it's how do you look at conceptual thinking that we teach uh, on on to solve problems not as an expertise but as a pieces of the puzzle and 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 like an anthropologist who would look at from both from the thirty five thousand foot and a zero five foot simple. I give a simple example which I I think Arunji ko bola tha. Like for example, how do you reach out providing solar to people who earn less than say 10 rupees a day or 15 rupees a day? They, they earn around 500 to 600 rupees a day. Are you unko subsidize karna chahiye? They will thank you. They, boss, what they need is four hours of lighting. Let's look, they, not, they do not need solar lights. They need four hours of lighting. We confuse between products and services, right? And they're willing to pay one rupee a day. We put up solar panels on a school. And then we had the light and battery at home battery being less than the weight of a lunchbox. The kid comes to school, plugs it into the school's charging station. If she doesn't come to school, there's no light at home. The mother says, I don't care whether you study or not, go to school because I need light at home, right? Suddenly, it's a, it's a solar panels become infrastructure on the education system. So it's like A plus B plus C A is a coal fired plant. B is a transmission line, C is your house. A is the school, B is the kid, C is, the, C is your house. You can suddenly, you think it's not about it's about solving a problem. Same thing you can actually look at water, sewage, livelihoods, um, or whether how do you look at the city community in central uh, uh, Central Karnataka who earn less than 1500 rupees a day, but a guarantee mechanism in a financial institution not only helps them find solar, but also makes them go multiple rungs in the social ladder. And how do you bring those thinking processes when you teach and I would say it's more about how do you give hope to a lot of the kids at class one, class two, class three, do a systems thinking. I don't, Todo boss, if you get a computer, you can see what's going on inside. Only when you break it, rather than we start with a no culture, don't touch it, don't. Because we're born and brought up that way. Don't, don't go there. We learn too many don'ts. That's where our innovative. So, so my failure of a state, yes, but failure of the middle class and upper class is more hitting me from last nine months. Yes, it was there, but more so, I found less people doing and inspiring other people to go and do it, boss. Don't tell me that I have to go Excel sheet, mein, plus comparison, do I do this, do I do that? That will go in that way. Boss, if you want to take an unreserved from Calcutta to Delhi, go and stay near the unreserved when it crosses Dhanbad station and you find out, boss, start owning the problem of this country. Go and fail. And 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 that is what we will we will I will risk, I will go. And 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 that's where I think. As, I mean, a systems approach where you get away from this whole. Is like I said, boss. I'm not going to take resumes. And and you want MIT, se ho, tum fourth grade dropout. Ho. Tumara salary level will be dependent on how you contribute to what you're doing for the organization. Plus, and you can represent us in Dubai or in Singapore or Delhi. I don't care if you're fourth grade or tenth grade. How do you break that casteism, the racism of our education system? Ki jo angrezi baat karta, jo degree laya, wo bahar hai. So I think that's where I think I would say that's a failure of citizens to think in a manner of inclusion that I don't even know when I talk about when people when when my biggest I'll arrange your last is when I when I went and spoke at one of these big IT or whatever they called me for senior management of the vice president of the organization tells me, Harish, you have a PhD. Do you have intellectual discussions in rural areas? That's where ah. the failure is. <laughs> okay. That's the failure yes, yes. of the system. Yes, yes, and yes. And once yes. we rectify yes. this, we can actually solve the others. Okay. You know, you, you, you. Uh, um, firstly, you demonstrated, uh, Harish, uh, as always, your passion 
and it's all in action. It's not just talking about things, you do things and from that you're reflecting. And we said this, that the more educated we are, the less useful we are for society. It really challenges, a lot of thinking challenges me, but it's right. And when you said that, you know, we think some of us that I have a solution, then I'm going to look for a problem to which my solution fits. Now I've been a consultant and they say about consultants that for a consultant with a hammer, every problem is a nail. So you go there and you define the problem to suit the solution that you have. So when you're looking at what's going on in the country, there will be people who will say, oh, we've got an economic problem or a trade problem because they have the tools to solve that problem. But as the book has pointed out, Rajshaker, like he said, the Ludhiana example, it's deindustrialization de in the Punjab is not only to do with trade and investment with industry, there are many other things. So going to system thinking, as you were saying there, and I like for the action, as you said, who will show us the alternatives that are possible. And you are doing that. And Mekla was pointing out to this, that there are many, many examples in India of people who have created the alternatives. But then we come to saying, scale up. And the scale up then come to create Selco with 20,000 people. Then we scaled up that. And you're saying, no, that's not it. Hmm? Right. Each community is going to be solving its problem. People collaborating with the, within the community understanding the system and solving it. And what is our role from the outside then? It is to enable the communities exactly. to solve their problems. And then they stand on their own feet and they are self-reliant and then solve the problem as is uniquely required. Like in the Northeast, I'm sure your uh, solutions have to be quite different to the ones that you have in the middle of India and absolutely so. So there we're coming to just five more minutes. I, Indrajit, uh, I mean, we can frankly, uh, uh, three speakers here have more time. I'm happy to stay here for another half an hour, if you like, but I don't know what time Anmol has given us for. Uh... No, no, let's continue. I mean, I've, uh, I I think we'd, uh, we'd need a little more time uh, for that conversation to, I think, develop. Um, I'm, I'm guessing if the speakers and the panelists are okay, we, we leave the option to the audience as well to to join continue uh, if someone has to go then I'm, I'm sure they can excuse themselves if that's let me check with Nekla, uh, Rajshikar and uh, uh, Harish uh, how much more time can you give us uh, another half an hour 15 minutes half an hour is yeah. fine I'll leave at five yes uh, Harish absolutely I have all the time in the world okay. <laughs> not a big deal so let's see how much time until yeah, five sure. minutes uh, let's see. Okay, so now let's come to some questions uh, from uh, uh, people. Uh, first of them is from Anmol himself, who I guess wanted to make sure that his question <laughs> wasn't lost. And I'm going to take that one in the deep thereafter. Please help me with the with questions. Sure. He says, what are some examples of large scale complex democratic countries or organizations which have taken good steps in institutionalizing this way of thinking, serving and operating? Uh, let me point this out. Uh, that uh, this is something that, uh, you know, Harish uh, and I've spoken and I've been spending my time on this. Uh, can India find its own solution or does India have to look outside for its solutions? Hmm? Um, and if we wish to solve a problem properly, it has to be a solution that applies where the problem is. So India would have to find its own solutions to its complex problems. But Talking about this matter that where are people solving complex systems problems where many things are interacting and giving people, local people, the agency. One is you positively give them the agency. The other is because there's nothing to help them. They just take on the agency and they solve the problem. So India is replete with both sorts of examples there. And because of our scale, there are, to my knowledge, many more examples of what Harish has been describing uh, to us and what we are saying is the solution in India than anywhere else. And I've been noticing in the international awards that are given for the best examples of social change. And these are not, you know, celebrated. We celebrate the biggest companies and, and all of that in the crowds that we usually are in. Indian organizations or Indian networks win generally one third to half of those recognitions. So look within ourselves and let's be an example of if you want to do it for that reason, to show the world that uh, we can teach them, but it's not for that reason. So my thought and more to you is, let's keep looking within India. Let's keep looking within India. 
for these examples hmm? and then generalize some principles out of those and the the scale is going to come not by scaling up any one example the scale is going to come in the process that there'll be many good solutions apt for their situations all over our diverse country and therefore the outcome will be on scale not the solution on scale the outcome will be on scale harish you want to make one yes please make sorry yeah very uh, a quick point actually partly to also um, you know um, harish is very provocative and i think important interventions but um, you know i think sometimes when we think systemically and and it's about understanding the interconnections but it's also important to understand the purpose of various systems that provide certain services right and and this used to happen a lot i remember in the early days of microfinance where you know if the microfinance challenge channel worked then people would say let's also do nutrition education in that why don't we also add in health systems on that why don't we also deliver some education the education system is failing we'll do and i said no you know when i go to the bank i don't expect to be given an education as well um and i don't also get my blood tested like we actually have the privilege of multiple good institutions and services that function for us sometimes when it comes to solving problems we you know mix i think complexity and interconnectedness so it's much better to understand you know when you grow certain crops it has multiple effects and you want to engage with that and understand that but you are going to grow crops and you are going to sell some of those crops those will have certain kinds of effects and i think somewhere understanding you know so for public goods uh, there is a particular role that the state has to play mm -hmm. right and we have to understand this like we you know and this is little bit i think that happens you let the state off the hook um you know but we let ourselves off the state a uh, hook because we let our state off the hook um and so i think it is important to think about who has to play many different kinds of these different roles um and it's an important point that rajekar makes in his book about political parties and you know the the political scientist nancy rosenblum at harvard in defense of partisanship actually says uh, she feels that political parties have this very special role uh in you know providing you know three things an inclusive character so that many different kinds of people can fit under a party identity the responsibility for telling a comprehensive public story about the economic social and moral changes of a particular time and the disposition to compromise right now she says it's political parties now it's an interesting idea that that is the role of good partisanship right um in a political in a, certainly in a democratic system but if we are not going to hold political parties to that or maybe we should and that's the point about reimagining what political parties in india could be about rather than just about patronage and networks what other institutions are to play this complex role of mm -hmm. inclusion comprehensiveness and compromise mm -hmm. good questions from uh, uh, our uh, participants other than the panel mr marad ram has a question uh, ram do you want to unmute yourself and ask yeah I, yeah my question is for harish uh, uh, harish you spoke about uh, decentralized solutions uh, my question is uh, are there any specific areas where uh, decentralized solutions work and other areas where uh, centralized solutions work and I, as i was typing i also heard uh, mekla talk about the role of the state which is in some ways a, a centralized approach uh, so uh, would love to have uh, both uh, uh, make clear if you can expand it to decentralized versus centralized and harish if you can uh, share your perspectives on that that will be thanks so if i can i i, I if i can pick up on make clear said about the state yeah, absolutely and for example in the in, in the education and and health services but see the question for us um when, when what we do is we we look at the state in two different uh, we keep the political aside and we look at the the bureaucratic the dc uh, uh, so for example a colleague of mine his only job is the best suppose we are working in uh, in the state of meghalaya who are the top 20 champion dcs and where are they getting transferred to because a, a particular dc has two to three years of work a district commission in that district 
if a good dc passionate dc who understands system strain also usko pakdo like and and same thing one of the dcs actually now has become health secretary of meghalaya unko we had done 10 uh, health centers in in hines district of say east garo north garo abhi what he has done is was let us do 350 health centers solar powering democratizing it i don't care who the government was like he says was hum log to rahenge na yaar tumko tumko tension kya right so so create champion dcs create champion teachers keep create champion bureaucrats champ even when people say the rural banks the whole issue of oh the rural banks are not financing boss it's not don't don't throw the whole thing on the banks there are champion bankers 30% of them are brilliant they will show the next 30% how to do it. they will show the next 30% the question is just like i mean nothing is institutionalized in the world i mean if it was so good where we worried whether it's obama was the president or the trump was the president it all depends on individuals and how they actually change the system and same way the dc in meghalaya i don't know you know who which party and how they are allocated the dc and there are a bunch of eight is good is young 32 33 i mean good a b hota ki wo hostel junior hai that also helps sometimes but the fact is it changes same thing in manipur same thing in karnataka i might succeed very much in gulbarga because the state the panchayat and the whole system is very good can we make them a showcase now i when uh, uh, last thing is that manipur did something they should you we heard you have done something with the mp government can you actually showcase that to us and we will do it see it's that patience game that we do who in uh, mp helped us do that and so there are your bureaucracy that can help and and regarding uh, centralized or decentralized the best answer from was from a from a dc who said was the policies let it be which pushes for large scale dissemination of policies or guarantee funds or manufacturing of a like large scale manufacturing of solar panels will actually help in lowering the cost because the end value of what the poor do with the solar panel is more important than manufacturing of solar panels is a democratization and decentralization of the end value that is more critical than the supply or manufacturing of those and those are things where we hybridization of centralization and decentralization is what we need to uh, do but as long as we decentralize income generating activity so the power the power of money the power of thoughts and has to be localized so that it doesn't get disturbed by even if a covid came in it doesn't get disrupted and i think those are the, how do we balance centralization with like that but there are champions everywhere and we will not let go of the dc because of manipur now 200 and 300 health centers in meghalaya is doing it because of which karnataka is telling to bangalore mein baith ke you're not taking our support i said was you were too late meghalaya did it first so it's how do you play them and there are champion dcs everywhere who who can do it like to change make love your thoughts yeah i'm um just uh, you know um, i think mr mara you mentioned you know sort of this idea of replication right and you know this idea that now you have to replicate and that's how you scale up versus no, no, uh, replicate no, no, no that you're saying that's not how you to do it that's right that's uh, right Yeah, yeah yeah exactly that you know this idea that you know it's innovation and then replication and here we are actually looking at that model doesn't work it is about large scale systems um if you want to look at large complex systems there is no way to do it without decentralization so i mean i think decentralization is vital to have the larger the system the more complex the problem the more you need decentralized capacity the indian state has always imagined and understood this uh, it's there in the constitution when we look at lists we went further in creating a certain idea of local government the problem is nobody actually likes to do decentralization in practice the people who actually are that so the state center centralizes from the states the state state tends to centralize from the local government and we don't build that kind of decentralized capacity what you end up needing actually at the higher levels you know this is true of mis as well i mean i'm sure harish will know much more of this but in health systems for example we collect tons of data micro data at the ground level that the anganwadi worker will connect or the anm will collect and it is all sent up for analysis 
at a point where the person at the top actually will never analyze this data. Now, who can tell you which Anganwadi needs particular kinds of services or which um, well needs to be chlorinated, right? It's that data should actually be at the ground level. You need the greatest, densest data where it's most useful. You need very few indicators to actually go at, to the top. Uh, we have misdesigned our systems where the top sits with lots of data, doesn't know what to do with and doesn't analyze. And people collect data at the ground level, but don't get analyzable data. So I think, you know, flipping these systems is extremely important. I think there is an increasing role for coordination and consensus building. As the economy gets more complex, problems do come up as society. And, and this is where we again have not built mechanisms for interstate um, coordination and even at the district level across departments, all of this. So this is where I think some level of coordination, consensus building, decision making is important. Uh, it's an interesting question. I do think directions in terms of public investment, for example, we're just at the point of a budget. Now, when you have I think the most important role for the state at that level is to give direction, right? And then to support that direction with a series of investments. Now, well-directed public investments also need to be directed at the decentralized level. But so whether how we develop policy, whether policy decision-making can be more decentralized is, is an interesting question. And, and this is just you know, something that Lant Pritchett always has talked about, that difference between discretionary and transaction intensive services, right? The toughest things to deliver are those that are both discretionary and transaction intensive, right? Discretionary, you tend to do policy making the way we do it in India, at least it, see, it's often very discretionary. Um, immunization may be somewhat transaction intensive. But you know, doing good behavior change communication, good education, you know, proper crop planning or agroecological based planning is always a combination of discretionary and transaction intensive. And those are the toughest to deliver, but the most important to decentralize. And that's where I would actually think we have to really rethink how we build institutions and capacity. Thank you. Indrajit, any uh, other question? You're keeping track of- uh, Yes, I'm keeping track. Uh, not at the moment, but so if you have some more issues that you want to surface, Mr. Myra. I don't want to, but I want to ask Raj Shekhar finally. Sure. Raj Shekhar, you are the great listener learner. Now you heard uh, 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 Mekla and uh, Harish. Uh, do you have any questions you would like to ask them or any observations of the pattern in their thoughts that you would like to point to? <clears throat> well, a couple of things. Um, the easiest to take is the inspired despite debate. Uh, we couldn't go with inspired because there's another book on India which starts with in spite of the gods. So, in spite went off the window right then and there. Okay. Uh, despite, I think, has a, a greater anger running through it, which is where I come from as a reporter. Uh, what's always interesting, you know, um, so my friends used to joke about Chhattisgarh having separate departments for notes and votes, note vibhag and vote vibhag. And what's always been interesting is to sort of look at the fact that there is this curious Janus face nature to the state. You know, that the health department in Panj in Tamil Nadu will simultaneously deliver three different outcomes. It will do an extraordinary job on institutional deliveries. It will, however, find its IMR and MMR plateauing. And it will see immunization decline very steeply uh, over a five-year period, the same five-year period for all three of these. And that's one question, that how does the same health department give you three starkly different outcomes. Um, so I've always found that to do, to do investigative reporting, I don't need sources. You know, all I need are really good contradictions. If you find a contradiction uh, or you find a sudden discontinuity, there's usually a story in there somewhere, which is how I sort of have uh, most of the book is structured around contradictions and discontinuities in a sense. 
sudden the latter is essentially something there are familiar process abruptly starts giving a very different result uh, so that's a second sort of a thing what harish is saying uh, i was just thinking that you know um, yes we can we have the diversity to be able to hold out solutions for the world in the same way that the crises we face you know um, like this the book basically talks about a kleptocratic capture of the state and it's again a very familiar universal sort of a theme uh, and i suppose one question for us is that and this is for harish uh, mr mayra and mekla that how do you take a state that is increasingly kleptocratic okay it's not only these six uh, you look at telangana or any other state uh how do you sort of make sure that the developmental aspects of the state don't get degenerated into uh symbolism mosaic performative which is what i think we are seeing uh i take the point that there are always theories of constraints that we operate within and that there are spaces for navigation uh but to me that looks like the question that these processes of disposition are accelerating in this country development as we see in the tamil nadu chapter is getting performative how do you sort of turn this around given that the political will is more of a political vote so that's it well um, um i think uh, since there are no more questions um, and i'm not going to ask uh, uh, anyone uh, more to uh, tell us what uh, they are summarizing because i think uh, each of us is going to be taking away some thought and some question or seeing a new pattern which needs to be explored in our own minds and i'm in that position now in that position that i'm not going to try to summarize um, i'm just going to pick up in the what has been said in the last few minutes about the way to bring about change in a complex system in which we are all ourselves a part we are not outsiders like experts telling this system how it is going to change we are inside we are inside in many ways we are physically and uh, socially situated inside also our thinking is colored by the thinking around us uh, uh, in the system so it's about redesigning something of which we are a part so this is the first reorientation that i'm not an engineer and designer of a system of which i'm not a part my own thoughts must change because they are a part of the system that has to be changed so um that's one thing second is as mekla you pointed out about uh, the uh, and harish has been saying this uh, uh, very eloquently before is the the listening and learning to each other i mean there are things happening in different parts of the system some are affecting us without being a solution but some appear to be like the we mentioned about the dcs uh, champion dcs they appear to be an idea of how change can be brought about in a system we're just taking the approach that is taken there and broadly that same approach applied by someone else but not the solution could be the way more seeds of change will grow most importantly talking about the political system and political parties the political parties are as you're saying is collections of people who begin to share a same ideology or subscribe to the same ideas and who want the world to be more like that so it's a movement for change it's when the political parties become the vehicles for electoral politics that the bad things start to happen so some discussion in my mind and it's been going on for a while is about the uh nature of democratic institutions that the world needs uh we will need movements of people collecting together agreeing that this is what we all want together because that's how change is produced in complex systems but they should not become political parties for the sake of winning elections uh, winning elections is this possible I don't know but this is i think uh, what many people are searching the answers for so i'm leaving with these questions about how change is produced how power is gathered how new ideas 
uh, gain more, more salience when old ideas haven't delivered the results uh, in, a, in a system. So thank you, Harish. Thank you, Mekla. And thank you very much, Raj Shekhar. Thank you, Indrajit. And thank you for all those who have been listening in and the questions that you have asked. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayra. Um, I, I just want uh, to take a minute to thank all our panelists on behalf of the Founding Fuel team and the audience uh, for joining. I think this was a very invigorating session as it was expected to be. It, it lived up to all those uh, expectations and more. Um, for three reasons in my mind, I mean, and I won't take too much time, uh, the whole thing of unpeeling the onion that Rajshekhar spoke about, usually to understand large complex systems. Um, uh, Mekela spoke about also looking at things that work, which I thought was interesting too. And how do we kind of process those in juxtaposition with things that don't work, right? And um, I think Harish uh, spoke about the, the elite capture of education and how COVID has exposed the gaps that exist. Who are the change makers that will solve the most challenging problems that face our country? Um, will it be people from the community who don't have access to education of the kind that we're, we, we're used to? Um, people without the language skills and the technical education? Um, I think it'll, I think Harish has given, given us a lot of food for thought in terms of where the change makers of the future might really come from. And Mr. Myra, of course, uh, with his very, very thoughtful um, uh, interjections and questions and comments, I think um, it's been a very, very uh, stimulating session. So thank you really, um, uh, all four of you. I really appreciate Mr. Myra, uh, Mekila, Rajshekhar, Harish, and the audience for joining us. I hope it's, it's been useful. If you'd like to leave your comments as, uh, before you leave, uh, that'll be really wonderful. And we'd like to keep this conversation going. Thank you again. Bye.